All right, so when it comes to modern healthcare, conventional medicine often separates the mind and the body apart from each other. See, you visit a psychologist for mental health and a primary care physician or a specialist for physical health. But then there's functional medicine, which bridges the gap between the two. And today's guest is Dr. Jenna Montana. She's a chiropractor, a nutritionist, and an acupuncturist who looks at the way the mind affects the body and the body affects the mind. She speaks from the heart and from experience to help each of us tap into the potential we have within ourselves to heal our mind, body, and soul. Welcome to Drawn, the podcast that draws you in with stories of hope, healing, and even a little hustle while battling anxiety and depression. Think you have to wait until you've conquered your mental illness to start living a joyful, meaningful life? Think again. Conquering your mental illness is part of living a life you love, and we're going to figure it out together. I'm Katie Roshetko, and this is Drawn. Well, hello, Jenna. Thank you so much for being here with us today. I'm so excited to have you in the studio, which is also my living room, but you are the first guest we have ever had in person because of COVID. So welcome. I'm so excited you're here. Well, thank you for having me. I am so excited to be here. Um, I, I love an opportunity to talk about mental health and talk about functional medicine. So this is, this is my joy. (laughs) And this is also your career. So I would love for you to introduce yourself and what it is that you do. Yes. So I am, um, trained board certified doctor of chiropractic, but I also hold a master's degree in nutrition. And so that allows me to, with my doctorate, look at people from a holistic perspective. And um, with my master's, I'm, I'm really working with folks on their diet, as well as um, maybe implementing a therapeutic way of eating. So um, a lot of people hear diet and they associate it with weight loss, but that could also mean um, going gluten-free due to a GI disorder, or um, it could also mean uh, going low carbohydrate due to a metabolic problem. You know, So it doesn't always have to be associated with weight loss. Um, and so I, I really help people harness the, the healing power of foods and help their body just fuel what it's designed to do, which is take on all of our daily tasks and stressors and things and, um, just thrive, you know, in, in light of all of that. And so it doesn't seem like that must be very common to have chiropractic and nutrition as a career field like is that kind of just something where you've combined two passions together into one and how did that work (laughs) yes I was the I was a black sheep in school so I um a lot of my classmates they came to chiropractic school either due to a family member that was a chiropractor um or they were maybe a college athlete or high school athlete that suffered an injury and went to a chiropractor and had this amazing healing testimonial I um had neither of those (laughs) I was um, just really into nutrition from a young age, um, initially through vanity. You know, I was overweight as a teenager and I just didn't want to be anymore. So I, um, you know, rather than counting calories and obsessively like restricting or anything, um, I was fortunate enough to have a uh, family member, family friend who was a personal trainer. And so she taught me a lot about just processed foods and soda. And, um, you know, I was, I was eating trash. So, um, she cleaned up my diet and just taught me how to eat real food and not skip breakfast and just very basic nutritional things that we kind of like lose in the shuffle of life. And, um, I lost the weight. And so I was like, proselytizing to everyone like you don't know what's in your food you have to stop eating that so I was that kid for all my you know a majority of high school majority of college and I felt like I had a passion for nutrition I had to do something with and I didn't want to be a registered dietitian necessarily because I felt like I was going to be confined to just diets, meal plans, programs. And of course, that was ignorant because registered dietitians can do so much more than that. But it was just my narrow lens. And I think it's one of those things that you um, you get something set in your mind. And you it was almost, in retrospect, uh, productive because I wouldn't have explored chiropractic. I wouldn't have met my husband in school. I wouldn't have done like all of these things. You see how the dominoes were just lined up and it just took one thing to knock them all down. So 
I apologize to any registered dietitians <laughs> listening. Um, I think you're all phenomenal and, uh, and a very important part of our healthcare system. But I just, for one reason or another, had this mental block about it. So I um, looked into nutrition programs. A chiropractic school came up on Google, and I thought, what is that about? <laughs> um, so that's how I ended up there. And I, I really struggled for the first six semesters um, wrapping my head around, I love nutrition, but everyone's teaching me how to look at the spine, how to assess the musculoskeletal injuries, how to take x-rays, how to do all of these things that I don't really see myself doing in daily practice. So um, I had a little bit of a, a reckoning and I, I dropped out of school <laughs> for a semester because I felt like I'm not living in alignment with, I'm not I'm doing all this work. I'm hustling. I'm taking board exams. I'm trying to get really good grades for a career path that I don't necessarily feel like I'm going to love, um, only to be encouraged to come back and shown that, yes, you can, in fact, be a doctor of chiropractic and practice uh, nutrition. It's called functional medicine. So that's how I arrived there in a very windy way. Um, but... Yeah, does that answer your yeah, question? Yeah, that, that does, <laughs> and it leads me to a dozen more. So okay. first of all, functional medicine is something that I had never heard of until you and I talked last week yeah. about what it is. I'd never mm -hmm. heard that term before. Holistic healing, a little bit more, mm -hmm. but only in the this is hippie medicine sense, yes, right? Yes. So functional medicine, it's interesting to me that that was something that you hadn't even heard of before until you're trying to figure out how to merge all these different passions and stuff into a career field. So I guess my first question is, what is functional medicine? And then the second follow-up question is, why is it not as well known? Okay. Um, functional medicine is a, uh, it's really an approach to medicine. It's, there's no special sauce. It's um, a way of looking at a classic medical issue. And instead of saying, you know, okay, this is IBS. This is the remedy we do for IBS you trace it back a little bit and say, okay, you have IBS, but what factors in your life led up to this point for this disease process to occur? Or said another way, what is the root cause of this problem? And then we treat the root cause instead of treating all the symptoms. And so in treating the root cause, you address the symptoms, obviously, um, but that is the one thing that's really lacking in conventional medicine. You go to the doctor, they give you a diagnosis, and that's your day zero. But you've been dealing with this issue. Maybe it's been in the background for six years. You know, who's to say? Um, and then it finally all just culminated in one moment where you had this, you know, undeniable cluster of symptoms you had to go see a doctor for, right? So um, that is functional medicine in a nutshell. So we look at the root cause of a condition and also how all of the body systems are interacting with each other. So take IBS again as an example. You might see a gastroenterologist for that. And that gastroenterology specialist is going to be really good at looking at the gut, looking at the GI tract. They may even do a scope or colonoscopy or really, really get granular. Um, but they're not talking about diet. They might not ask you, what are your lifestyle factors that exacerbate your condition? Um, what, um, you know, have you ever taken uh, rounds and rounds of antibiotics that disrupted your gut flora that caused these symptoms to occur? So there's um, some critical questioning pieces that are kind of left out of that initial exam with certain specialists. Um, and they might not talk about how 10 years down the line with IBS and eating a certain way could go on to affect your liver, could go on to affect your heart with cardiovascular disease. So n all of these uh, conditions, they don't just stay confined to one area. Like we have these body systems that are contained within our bag of skin, if you will, <laughs> and they're all talking to each other and they all are relying on the same, um, you know, they're, they're all interacting and responding the same environment, you know? So um, functional medicine is a systems-based approach to medicine, looking at how all of these systems are talking and interacting too. So the reason why it's not as well known? Ah, yes. So it's not well known mainly because the term functional medicine, I want to say, was coined in the late 90s, early 2000s. So mm -hmm. it's been a little bit um, considered fringe. And then uh, integrative medicine came on the scene, and that was a popular buzzword for a while. So we kind of like 
rode on their coattails and um we haven't had the right platform until very recently to bring it to people in a large scale. So I think social media has done a lot to um, establish functional medicine as an approach to care, as well as um, aligning proper uh, figures such as Dr. Mark Hyman or um, Dr. Dale Bredesen um, and some of the other mothers and fathers of functional medicine who now have a platform like social media to bring it to the people. Um, so I was certified through the Institute for Functional Medicine and a lot of these mothers and fathers have been promoting the Institute for Functional Medicine as a resource for patients to find a provider near them. Um, it's also not mainstream because it's not really integrated in hospitals unless they're at the highest level, like the Cleveland Clinic. Um, that is one of the few clinics that integrate functional medicine principles. I believe um, there is also a medical college in Arizona that has like an integrative medicine fellowship. So if it's not part of the medical school curriculum and it's not part of hospital protocol, there's a good chance you're not gonna get that publicity because you're not gonna be within the health insurance model too. So that, that brings me kind of to another good point is that a lot of us are fee for service because we're not covered by insurance and our, our approach, which usually takes a long form um, approach to medicine, which is, you know, long initial history. My initial history is 90 minutes with patients has, I mean, that's very rare that folks spend 90 minutes with their medical provider ever, <laughs> unless it's on accident. <laughs> um, and so in that case, you really get to know your patient and their, their full medical history, um, which allows you to get the most data to make the best informed decision. Um, Insurance doesn't pay for that. It's a time-based game. So um, that might also be why we're not well-known, because insurance isn't sending people to us. Hmm. That's really discouraging, because I know that's a lot of the reasons why people don't get the care that they need, yeah. is because of insurance problems, and then also just a lack of information being out there. And so now I'm curious as to what kind of clients do you see? Sure. Um, so I see... Um, kind of the walking sick, if you will. So the folks that have been told by their doctors they're not that sick, it's all in their head, um, you know, just take this pill and that's the best we've got for you. Um, and so they're, they're searching for, one, an explanation as to how they arrived here with this issue. And they're searching for um, a different approach because maybe the remedies they've been prescribed aren't um, – you know, addressing their quality of life, you know, so maybe they're reducing some of their symptoms, but they've made new side effects or what have you, or they're just not addressing the problem good enough. Um, and so things like uh, GI issues in general, so that's your anything from acid reflux, IBS, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, celiac disease, um, respond really well to functional medicine because um, a lot of issues stem from the gut. And so we get really good at looking at the gut. Our assessment techniques are pretty good. Um, and most of it can be modified through diet uh, because that is where we interact with food, the GI tract. So I always start with GI issues. Um, there's even a naturopathic principle, which naturopathic medicine is probably uh, closest to functional medicine from a, you know, just baseline approach. Um, I'll look to, I think all disease begins with the gut. I think Hippocrates said something to that effect. Um, and so in that you can start with the gut and just go from there. Now that's not to say I don't see a lot of folks with um, thyroid issues, suboptimal thyroid numbers where their doctor said you don't have a hypothyroid problem. Um, but then you take a functional approach to looking at their lab work and you say, oh yeah, you're running on empty, you know, um, or things like um, just anything mediated by stress. So I see a lot of folks in like that fight or flight mode, that sympathetic overdrive. And so they're just wired and tired. They can't really put a finger on what the problem is, but they just don't feel right. Um, and so you can't go to your doctor and say, I just don't feel right, because they'll write you a prescription for antidepressants, which is fine if that's the problem. But a lot of folks, 
they have a profound iron deficiency or they have profound B vitamin deficiency, which is why they have no energy and why their brain can barely function for them. Not necessarily anything situational. So functional medicine is nice because we're going to ask you about your diet, but we're also going to ask you, is there anything situational that is going to make your healing process more difficult? Do you hate your job? Are you in a bad relationship? Are you not sleeping because you work night shift? You know, um, those are different lifestyle factors we take into account and help explain to the patient how they contribute to their condition. And I think that is the perfect segue because obviously the Drawn Podcast is all about mental health and you've kind of hit some buzzwords about stress Mm -hmm. and situations in your life that can cause you to just not feel right and not be able to understand why. So I'd love to know from your perspective, how about like anxiety and depression and does functional medicine help in what ways with that? Yeah. So if a patient comes to me um, with a diagnosed mental illness, I'll always ask them, um, how else are you managing this this condition? Are you seeing a therapist? Are you seeing a psychiatrist? Are you under the care of a licensed professional to handle this condition? Because while I don't treat anxiety, I don't treat depression, um, I look at maybe some of the other uh, physiological drivers of the condition and make sure that they're not suffering more than necessary. You know what I mean? So maybe they'll come to me and say, I just went through a divorce and I'm having terrible anxiety, but I go to a therapist and I'm getting 80%. I just want to get to that extra 20% and feel really in control of things. And so um, I'll say I'm happy to work as part of your healthcare team. You know what I mean? And so um, take anxiety for an example. Uh, We we associate that with a hyper activity of the adrenal glands with that cortisol release, our main stress hormone. Um, So I'm, I'm a big fan of cortisol testing. You can actually test it in your saliva. The best way to test it is a four point cortisol test because cortisol should go up in the morning. That's what wakes us up, opens our eyes from sleep, and then it should grab gradually come down. It kind of rises and falls with the sun. So we call that a diurnal pattern. Um, It's a very common test that I do because if you don't address the stress response, the stress response mediates the immune system, which mediates the healing process, and you're not going to gain any ground until you address stress. So um, that is where I see functional medicine play the biggest role for mental health issues. Um, it's just helping the physiological overactivation or underactivation if it's depression um, to make sure that that mind body loop gets broken. And so you start to feel different in your body, your mind will feel different and so on and so forth. So that's really interesting. So it's like you've got a lot of the times I feel like people will go to a psychologist or a psychiatrist for their mental health yep. and they go to their primary care physician for their physical health. Mm-hmm. But you're really looking at it as a, that holistic way of mind body synchronization almost. Yeah. And I, I was forced to acknowledge this relationship, uh, at a fairly young age. I was 17 years old when I, um, just stopped experiencing my menstrual cycle. Um, I say that like, boop, I woke up one day, everything was great, the birds were chirping, and I didn't have a period. No. This was in the hopper for months. You know, I was a senior in high school. I was under an immense amount of stress. I had applied early to the college of my dreams. I had no backups. I got waitlisted. Add to that, I was in a super toxic romantic relationship. I was trying to not phone in my senior year, so I was in all these different clubs and really over-applying myself. And um, I I had to come to grips with the fact that this was the most stress I'd been under uh, in my young adult life. And I um, added to the to that mix of things. I was under eating because I was so stressed and I was trying to control anything in my life that I could. And most teenage girls will reach for food as a means to control. And so I was just doing what culturally I had learned to do, right? So... You do that and your body is going to say, maybe ovulation isn't a great idea this month. We're going to skip. We're just going to take the heat off that that region. Um, Well, being in a toxic relationship, 
the question became, are you pregnant Ooh, <laughs> with the missed yes. period, right? So yikes. it was like, yeah. yeah, no, worst time ever. And so it, it obviously I was not pregnant, but it was just one of those added things that I did not need. And I saw very directly how my mental health had a bearing on my physical health and how my body pushes back when I'm stressed. Um, and I was kind of forced to acknowledge that. And so I never had a single practitioner. I went to a reproductive endocrinologist. I went to my gynecologist. Nobody asked me, are you under a lot of stress? Are you eating? What do you eat every day? Do you eat enough food to sustain a 17 year old woman's body? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and so, uh, since nobody asked, I wasn't going to say anything because I didn't want to get in trouble by an adult necessarily. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to volunteer such information. So, um, that was where I, I had realized I want to be the medical practitioner that asks those questions and is able to um, bridge that gap, you know, between mind and body because you're kidding yourself if you think there's no connection. Mm, wow. So at 17, was that when you realized the synchronization between mind and body or is that something that you've kind of realized looking back that that was where the moment was that really everything clicked I would say it was more of a retrospective kind of realization I remember in the moment feeling like so certain that I I ate plenty of food and I can handle all of this it's it's not my first choice to be waitlisted for my dream college but you know I guess I'll just have to I'll just have to deal with it you know I'll I'll be fine and then looking back you know maybe 2 years later as I started to research stress hormone as I started to research how to get my period back cuz of course it didn't just miraculously come back as I started college and yeah. was more stressed. Was more stressed. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I learned about this funky little hormone called cortisol and I learned about how it impacts ovulation and I learned about how calories are necessary for a regular reproductive cycle and things like that. And so it was like that V8, like, smack your head moment, like, <laughs> duh. Um, and I, once I realized that connection, I thought everybody needs to know about that connection. Mm-hmm. And so, um, I, I went out to, to go do that professionally yeah. and there was no name for it. So I <laughs> just, yeah, that's fascinating to me though. So I guess I'm curious now, what has kind of been your mental health journey since then and stuff because I can imagine that it wasn't all sunshine and roses from the time you you had this kind of bout of stress at 17 up to where you are now yeah so um it took it took some time you know I went to I got into the college that I was waitlisted from I I remember getting together a binder of like all my accomplishments and mailing it to the school and uh, letters of recommendation and really just like putting my nose to the grindstone to get into the school. And um, so I get in. Great. Awesome. Everything's good. (laughs) Enter (laughs) freshman year. I'm still in the super control cycle. And I develop uh, what I, I was never formally diagnosed, but what I, looking back, might diagnose a patient as orthorexic. So hyper-focused on the right types of foods, not quite anorexic, where I'm deliberately under eating anorexia nervosa, that caloric restriction, you know, condition. And I wasn't bulimic, but I was very rigid with the foods I would eat, the types of foods I would eat, they'd have to be quote unquote clean. They had to be, um, a certain amount of calories and fat. And, um, I would track my calories and then I would go to the gym and try to burn off what I had eaten that day. So I got the freshman negative 15. And unfortunately in our culture, we uh, celebrate weight loss, no regardless of the reason. And so I was flooded with compliments, especially being 20 pounds heavier or so in high school and never really having the reputation of being thin. People from high school were all of a sudden validating me on Facebook and MySpace and like, you know, so um, I I developed and flirted with uh, an eating disorder for lack of a better expression. And so um, that put a strain on my relationships with people that knew me and were concerned for me and I shut them out. And um, then life got a little more challenging and meanwhile, in the background, I'm getting birth control formulas switched up on me every year or so, which wow. then affects mental health. Of course, if anyone yes. has ever had a bad experience <laughs> with the pill. Yep. So we put me on a new formula and my body swings the 
other way and I can't stop binge eating. And so I um, gained 30 pounds in three months, which of course did a doozy on my mental health because I was so uh, wrapped up in my physical appearance, looking healthy. I'm, I, I always told myself, how am I going to teach anyone about diet and nutrition if I am five pounds overweight mm-hmm. and um, gaining all of that weight? So yeah. I was in direct conflict with all of my you know, life goals. And mm-hmm. I was a very all or nothing person at the time. So um, all of that to say, I had mental health support throughout a lot of it. Um, mental health was very openly talked about in my family of origin. And um, it was not uncommon for different role models in my life to go to therapy. It was not taboo. Um, But it just goes to show you that you can't acknowledge a problem until you're ready to uh, admit it exists. And so um, the right mental health counselor will gently nudge you, but maybe not present it to you when you're not ready. And I think that's... um, that's a problem a lot of people have with therapy is that they go and they have a really negative experience because they something was brought up that they weren't ready to, to bring up or um, something was brought to their attention that they maybe didn't agree with. And so um, all of that was going on in my life and I was still seeing uh, someone, you know, and that was keeping me pretty stable. But um, I think these were all necessary lessons for me to learn as a person who works with diet so intimately. So I can't even look back and say that was such a terrible experience. It was some of the most important lessons I'll ever get. Um, So fast forward, you know, struggling on and off with anxiety, low moods, crazy PMS, you know, feeling like almost PMDD, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, which is PMS at a hyper pathological level, Um, you know, and just always feeling like I could functional medicine my way out of it until I finally, um, I think the pandemic really made me admit that there is a place for Um, pharmaceutical intervention, you know, and and just have a plan to get off, you know, let it get you through an acute stressful period, but work with your provider, say, this is my exit strategy, and let's reassess in a certain amount of time. I don't think that conversation's had enough in in the mental wellness space. Wow, that, first of all, thank you for sharing your story, but I'm also a little mind blown that as somebody who loves functional medicine and preaches the the value of just diet, nutrition, sleep habits and stuff, you have still gone through and done a pharmaceutical route within your own life and really not completely dissed pharmaceuticals for solely this holistic lifestyle. Like you've really kind of embraced both sides of the medical field. And that's, to me, seems very rare. Like I have never heard of something like that. Well, you know, it's so funny. Um, Just this past week on Instagram, I was clicking around and I saw, uh, I believe it was Paleo Running Mama, who's a very open, um, you know, dietary based wellness account. Um, She posted a very poignant, um, post, for lack of a better word, about um, medication shaming within the holistic space and that it's like any of your depression is due to uh, food sensitivity or due to, it's, it can always be, you know, traced back to something you're doing wrong. And um, that's a toxic trait within the holistic world. I think that we should meet patients where they're at and not alienate them. Um, and I think that uh, in order to do so, you have to have a a healthy understanding that these medications do have a purpose and do have a role in healing. Um, and it's not a personal or moral failing if you have to approach that route. Um, and it's, you know, whether you're helping someone get on it or helping someone get off of it as a medical provider, um, and understanding and compassion is always going to be number one, I think, uh, if you're going to do it properly. And you mentioned uh, moral failing, and I think that was really important to note because that's exactly what I went through when I was in the process of really needing therapy and not wanting to go. My husband pretty much had to drag me to therapy, kicking and screaming, and I was the person who was going to sit on that couch with my arms crossed Mm -hmm. for the full hour and not say anything because of that idea that, like, 
I can't hack it in the real world. This is like, this is what happens to people who fail. Yeah. They have to go to therapy for it. And then when therapy led to needing medication, that was even more hard to accept because I was like, not only am I in therapy, but now I'm taking medication. Like there must be something wrong with me for not being able to handle this real world that I'm now in, that everybody else seems to be handling just fine. What's wrong with me? And then on top of that, all at the same time, you know, there was a lot of changes going on, good changes, you know, things like getting my dream job, things like marrying my best friend. But I was also going through the change of moving moving to a new city away from friends, change of leaving my church of eight, nine years, the change of, you know, your identity from, you know, girlfriend to wife, you know, from for me and my job, from producer to reporter, all within this three month time span. And for me, one of the symptoms that came out of that was I developed really severe gallstones and had to have my gallbladder removed. So it was change after change after change. Mentally, I was floundering and then on top of that my physical health was deteriorating and again six months all of that happened and stuff and it just blew my mind when I realized that deep down through a lot of therapy the root of that was my belief that all these things had happened and was happening to me because I had failed that I couldn't hack it in the real world and that it was a moral failing that all of the prep work in college all of the time and money and resources that were thrown into my education all of the belief that my professors or my parents had in me mm-hmm. was all for naught because here i was on my therapist's couch yeah. it was awful it was awful and now i can look back on it and be you know i just want to wrap that girl in my arms <laughs> and be like i'm so sorry that you ever felt that way but i have a feeling that i'm probably not the only one out there who has experienced that kind of psychological circle in your mind absolutely i mean i i joke that you know people who go to therapy do so because the people in their lives won't go to therapy (laughs) so um you know there's nothing wrong with therapy we developed communication as a species to exchange ideas okay Mm -hmm. that's all therapy is is two people exchanging ideas one just so happens to be educated in the Uh, pathology of ideas (laughs) and the other is afflicted with incorrect ideas generally about Mm -hmm. themselves right yes that's really where a lot of it comes from I think Um, and maybe they have grown up in a household that was chaotic I know you did a Mm -hmm. thing on aces yes um, the other I I just stumbled upon it the other day and so I was like Mm oh that's a great that's a great conversation (laughs) Um, because we actually uh, consider ACEs. ACEs, uh, the whole structure of the study, right? These 10 uh, different adverse childhood events that are kind of considered hallmark de- definers of trauma. Um, if they happen in that window, um, your risk of chronic disease exponentially increases the more ACEs you have. You're more likely to have heart disease. You're more likely to have diabetes, obesity, all of these different uh, modifiable life style driven diseases um so all of that to circle back on therapy and (laughs) feeling like um a moral failing it's we really have to normalize talking to a professional um i think that is is definitely where we start um it's funny it's almost like in some places i have lived it's more socially acceptable to take a pill for depression or anxiety than it is to actually talk to someone and that that kind of blows my mind as someone who um grew up in a household that was so open about stress and trauma and um psychology and Mm -hmm. mental wellness yeah and you know what's really interesting and it, it really wasn't until I started to talk about my own mental health journey that I found out through my parents the history of mental health in my family you know whether it was my dad's um fear of school growing up and and that has led to a lot of um need for performance and accolations and stuff, which is very rooted in what a lot of my triggers are, is that need to be desired and praised and stuff, and how that's led into seasons of depression for himself, um, cousins, aunts, uncles, you know, some who have, you know, unfortunately gone to the extreme, which has led to suicide, and then other people who have just gone through really dark seasons and stuff. You know, all of these people in my life that do have that hereditary line and stuff, but also just like knowing that like my family's not immune to this and yet my whole life 
we were the Rochette Co's. We didn't talk about it. You know, that happened. That was great for those people. Those people go to therapy. Those people get medication, but we deal with it ourselves. And so it really wasn't until I think I started talking about it that the conversations started to open up. And it was like, oh, like maybe we have a little bit more in common with this. And if we just keep talking about it, we won't feel so isolated because that's the thing about depression and oftentimes anxiety too, is that it feels so isolating. You feel like nobody else can possibly understand what you're going through or that you have failed so we like to keep those failures to ourselves and we don't talk about them and stuff but that feeling of being able to finally communicate with family and friends about what I'd been feeling for years was so freeing and I'm very fortunate that it was reciprocated and that it was given like comfort was given to me rather than being shunned um but i know that's a lot of people's fears when it comes to mental health well you know it's it's interesting that you say that because i think it's a a, you know acknowledged fear that nobody understands what i'm going through it's such a weakness that i can't hack it um but i see too when you're you're not feeling well you're not feeling your best you isolate yourself you withdraw you go inward and it's it's all about your pain your sadness and maybe there's a part of you that doesn't want to get that on anyone else so you shut yourself out and you don't share and there's another part of you know I don't want to be around those people um, and force anything out. I don't want to have to force myself to be happy. I don't want to force myself to be um, just calm, cool, and collected if being in groups gives me anxiety or certain things like that. So I think you, the condition itself puts you in isolation um, just intentionally, you know, and, and that completes this vicious cycle of, you know, not sharing and yeah. getting, getting help. Yeah, we don't want to be a burden on people. And that's Mm -hmm. often like, you know, uh, sacrificial to a fault almost. And like emphasis on the fault because we need people. Not only I think are we communication driven people, but we're community driven people. We are creatures who need community and to isolate us from that. Like you mentioned the pandemic, if anything taught us about our need for people (laughs) and in-person interaction, it was this pandemic that said no you can't do that for Mm -hmm. your own health risks and stuff and that was really traumatizing for a lot of people and I think not only did we have the physical fears of COVID and what that would mean but now we're seeing this huge mental health epidemic as well because more people than ever are now admitting Mm -hmm. that they have depression that they have anxiety that they're having PTSD that they're having other traumas and stuff in their life that are being triggered you know because of something that might have happened within this last year so I'm curious for you you know as a functional medicine doctor you know what have you seen coming into or through this pandemic and now kind of as we approach the other side are people coming to you and having the pandemic playing a role in their health absolutely I think um on the simplest Uh, in the simplest way, people gained weight in quarantine. So they want to um, address those, those quarantine pounds, so to speak. Um, And so they, they don't, you know, they, they're like, yeah, I'm snacking, but it just doesn't add up. Why is this so much weight, you know, or something like that. Um, So we, we might break it down from a lifestyle uh, approach. We may look at what their stress hormones doing, you know, Um, we may look at, um, are you not moving as much and how that impacts your mental health and your appetite and your energy levels and things like that. Um, in a more complex way, um, I've seen a lot of people just feel, uh, jolted into action from how people were, you know, people were more vulnerable to COVID who had comorbidities or these chronic, uh, conditions that might be reversible through lifestyle. So, um, I'm seeing folks that just want to turn over a new leaf, be healthier, um, and the conventional medical model has not really made them healthier. Um, and so they feel like I've got to, you know, what's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing and expecting different results. I've got to go to a new type of provider that's just going to look at this from a different angle. Um, so I think we will see the effects of COVID for many years to come. I, um, 
we'll sort of just leave it at that. Uh, functional medicine, you know, we we like to be as evidence based as possible, and so um, it's going to take some time for the research to come out and and see what remedies are helping and where we do play a role with COVID and maybe um, immune function support or um, just reducing that immune vulnerability. Um, but even in the mental health realm, um, how we help break that physiological cycle of fight and flight and stress response and stress hypervigilance. So um, maybe that's where we play the role. I don't mm. know. That's so interesting. One of the things I wanted to talk about, too, before we go is acupuncture, because it was a story that you and I had done with um, earlier. And um, what I really loved about understanding acupuncture and, and having you explain it to me was really the, the nerdy side of how it applies or how like the Chinese, ancient Chinese influence on acupuncture and how we've kind of shifted that into what we consider modern acupuncture and how not only does it help with um, back pain and muscle pain, arthritis, uh, migraines, but also mental health, stress of course being one of them. So I would love for you to kind of explain to all of of our listeners what it is that acupuncture is and how it can help even in the mental health field. Yes, of course. So acupuncture is the um, process of taking very fine filament needles and inserting them at very specific points in the body called acupoints. And those points fall along different um, channels of energy called meridians. And so um, we call them channels of energy. We call them meridians. Uh, these pathways if you look at them on an acupuncture uh, point like map, basically, um, they correspond with different blood vessels, different bony structures, different nerves. And so maybe in that lies the mechanism of how it works. Um, the, there are a number of working theories of how acupuncture works. Um, different points have been shown to cause local immune response. Um, there's some really new fascinating data on depression and inflammation of the brain, inflammation being an immune driven process. And so if the immune system's changing, uh, in the body at a specific acupuncture point, what the nervous system is going to pick that up and the nervous system is going to report back to the brain. So what's going on when we stick a needle in your hand, but it causes you to feel more calm, you know? Um, so acupuncture, that's, that's the technique. You take these filament needles, you put them in little acupoints, then they sit and rest for about 30 minutes and you'll lie still in a dark room, maybe a little bit of music playing and, um, just allow yourself to be still. I think something physiological happens when folks are just allowed to tune out for 30 minutes. Um, and so I think there are mental wellness benefits in that alone. Add to add the needles. You've got a beautiful combination. Um, <laughs> There's some really fascinating research about the vagus nerve or cranial nerve 10 that um, supplies our heart, our lungs, our GI tract, um, our throat and the muscles of our throat where we feel a lot of stress, right? That's kind of where I'm going with this. Um, there are branches of the vagus nerve that supply the ear and there are acupuncture points in the ear and there are these new vagus nerve stimulators that are these little wearable devices in your ear that are stimulating the vagus nerve and addressing things like PTSD, chronic anxiety, panic disorders, things like that. So um, all of that, I would argue, has its roots in acupuncture and the ability to stimulate these nerves without using um, anything other than a fine filament needle. Um, now, you can get a little techier than that. You can add an electrical current. You can um, add a heat lamp, which would increase blood flow to the area. Um, but at, at its very core base, you know, um, nature, it is sticking small needles into specific points and letting them rest. Um, so what was your question? How it ties back to mental health? Well, I mean, you kind of already explained yeah. it, but let's kind of go back. I mean, thousands of years ago, we, right. a lot of people believe that this started as a Chinese practice and yes. stuff, you know, and I think maybe that's where a lot of people think it has stayed and that's why they have kind of a discomfort with um, acupuncture because they think it's it's this old fashioned thing, but you kind of had an interesting perspective of, well, if it's been around as long as it has, mm -hmm. you know, maybe there's something to it, right? You know, right. like the the 
the benefits have not been disproven yet. Yes. Even though it's been around for thousands of years. So I'm curious, you know, maybe a history lesson a little bit as yeah. to how this all started in Chinese culture. Yes. And you, you bring up a great point that I, I should really reiterate. Um, these channels of energy, what is energy? You know, um, and so it's all built upon this idea of qi or life force energy. We are essentially made up of the same exact parts as a cadaver in a gross anatomy lab, but one of us is breathing and living and the other isn't. So what's the deal? Um, it, I don't know how much you wrap spirituality into your podcast or anything. Some folks might call that your spirit or your soul. Um, and so we have this animating force that we can't really measure. We don't know where it comes from, but we have it, right? And um, we acupuncture is modulating energy levels as they exist at certain acupuncture points in the body and or or changing chi or raising chi or you know reducing or sedating chi if it is overactive in a certain area um, and so to understand traditional chinese medicine is to um really just unlearn everything you know about conventional medicine. <laughs> um, but that's, that's, but honestly, I, I find this to be a more intuitive form of medicine. So um, there are ways of diagnosing people by looking at their physical constitution. Do they look healthy? Are their eyes nice and bright? Is their skin clear? Does it have a dark tinge to it or a yellow tinge to it? Look in their mouth. Um, the mouth is the gateway to the body. Um, and so is their tongue a, a discolor? You know, is, is their tongue discolored? Um, does it have bite marks on it? That can be an indication of illness in the body. Um, does it have cracking? That can be an indication of illness somewhere. So they had all of these methods of physical examination because they didn't have MRIs. They didn't have blood tests. They didn't have... Um, microscopes even to yeah. see if a bacteria was taking over. They had to just physically assess the person and um, estimate what was going on in their body. They measured pulse rates. They measured the quality of the pulse. They did all of these things um, to assess someone's health. And they even asked them about relationships. They asked them about their sleep patterns. They asked them about, um, are they grieving? Are they experiencing adequate joy? And it was all about, is their life in harmony and balance, both energetically within them, but also um, in their environment? Um, in, in the form of acupuncture, I practice uh, five elements. We look at each season as having its own elements. Summer is fire, late summer is earth, um, and you know it gets a little more humid and a little more hot and damp, and then we transition to fall, which gets very dry. Um, that will transition to winter, which is a little more um, you know watery, wet, snow sludge you know all of that which then transitions to spring and that's where we associate you know the leaves coming out uh that would be the element of wood you know and so and and so in that your body could be more vulnerable to an energetic imbalance based on the season they'll just say that um and then of course all those elements correspond with emotions so you know summer and fire we associate that with joy like your heart's on fire you know um and the heart is not surprisingly the organ of fire you know so i mean you really just like unfortunately for me to un summarize this in like five minutes is <laughs> doing it such a disservice <laughs> but i'm doing my best yeah um so they even took emotional patterns and incorporated that into how someone's disease process takes hold. Um, and so if your emotions are out of balance, that can perpetuate a condition. But if you have a condition, it's going to have a certain impact on those emotions mm -hmm. and those emotional states. So that's what I always found so um, healing and validating about Chinese medicine is that they take those things into account mm -hmm. when they go to treat someone. The original functional medicine. I would say so. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So now you have also touched on something about the importance that our environment plays on our mental health and our yeah. physical health. Yes. Um, we have a lot of control in mm -hmm. our environment. Mm -hmm. um, but And so I'd love to talk to you about what are the things that we can control that we really should be looking at and evaluating in our own life. Mm -hmm. And then maybe we can follow up with what about when times in your life 
things are outside of your control. Yeah. What can you maintain and how do you maintain things, you know, in heightened levels of yeah. stress? So yeah. starting first with things that we can control. What are the important things to really help our bodies and our minds be at their top shape? My instinct, my gut tells me um, sleep. So making dietary changes can be incredibly challenging, especially depending on budget, depending on access, depending on education level and what you even know about nutrition. You might even not, not even know where to start. So I don't even say start with diet. I say start with sleep because pretty much everyone sleeps, right? Everyone should know if you look at at a baby, what does a baby do? Baby sleeps. Mm -hmm. And babies, I use babies as an example because babies are the freshest, like un, untouched, unadulterated, you know, <laughs> um, little humans and examples that we have. And then as we age, we get exposed to stuff and we get into these patterns and all this stuff. So I go back to, okay, baby's main functions, eats, poops, sleeps, breathes, moves, you know, and, and all of that. So those are the things we can control. Are we going to the bathroom every day? If not, we got to get a handle on that. <laughs> are we sleeping eight, seven to eight hours a night, waking up rested? Um, when we go down to sleep, do we fall asleep quickly? Or are we sitting there racing, mind wandering and, and keeping us awake, right? Um, so I think about those. And then I think about, are you moving? The body was designed to move. We have a brain so it can control a body that moves. That is a well understood and appreciated, you know, uh, theory within neurology, right? So if you got a brain, you got to move. Um, and so when life hits the fan, <laughs> we need to go back to the basics of, am I sleeping? Am I going to the bathroom and having that quote unquote, cathartic release. And am I moving my body and, and letting it, um, you know, giving it gratitude for what it does for me. And sometimes one of the easiest ways to do that is to move. So if you can't fix your diet, you can do some non dietary things to foster wellness mm -hmm. and support your mental health for sure. Well, see, I love that you said that because for me, there was a turning point in my, my desire for exercise was mm -hmm. last fall fall and I and I have been that person who has tried pretty much every gym every workout yeah. and nothing has ever clicked long term I was yeah. very just like overwhelmed I didn't like the way I looked so the last thing I wanted to do was go to the gym yeah where yeah. I'm focusing on how I and look you know and standing, trying, in yes, mirror. standing in front of a mirror yeah. in front of all of these other people so I was very staunch and like avoiding the gym unless maybe a friend would drag me mm -hmm. and it wasn't until I was listening to I believe it was a Rachel Hollis podcast mm. and she had said something about how a turning point in her life was when exercise became not a punishment of the things that you ate that yes. day, but actually a celebration of all that your body can do. Yeah. And when I changed my attitude from thinking of the gym as this like grinding, grueling thing that I have to do mm -hmm. and more of a joyful occasion of just like, look at what I can do it, with my body. I can yeah. run, I can jump, I can yeah. lift weights, I can do sit-ups, mm -hmm. I can row on a rowing machine, and I can have fun with these people, I can listen to great music and stuff. Yeah. Suddenly it became a joyful experience rather than a punishing experience. Yep. And so I love that movement and sleep are two of the things that you just harped on because those have been instrumental in my own health. Yeah. I suffered from migraines pretty much my whole childhood, mm. all the way through most of college. And I realized for me, a big trigger was the fact that I was getting maybe five hours of sleep a night mm. because of life just being stressful and yeah. you having all these commitments. And as yep. soon as I was able to choose for myself that I was going to go to bed at 10 o'clock, like that was religion for me yes. and stuff, you know, yes. I was like, I'm, if I have to get up early, I'm going to bed early. I'm not mm -hmm. just going to bed at midnight because mm -hmm. that's what time I go to bed. Yeah. Like, it's like I had to kind of change all of that. Mm -hmm. So sleep has been instrumental in helping with my migraines and now movement has been helpful in honestly just my mental health, which is in turn affected my physical health because obviously I'm moving way more than I ever have before and I've lost about 15 pounds just in about like eight months or so wow. not through any extreme dieting or anything like that yeah. but just simply not sit, sitting you know pun intended in my sedentary lifestyle that I yeah. have been for you know three years now yeah. and stuff so that was huge for me so I'm so glad that you said that well I like that answer too um you know I like those two things because they're free 
Sleep is free. Walking outside of your house is free. Now, granted, not everybody lives in a safe place. They can go for a walk, but you can walk around your house. You can turn some music on and dance in your house. Mm -hmm. You can, um, you know, and, and it doesn't have to be this grinding, sweating, grunting, you know, um, self-abuse <laughs> it can be just a celebration of you and your body so it can be doing squats at the kitchen counter it can be doing um you know like i said dancing it can be um leg lifts while you watch tv um i don't feel like i think we have to get a little more creative and unfortunately um, mental illness can sometimes be the killer of creativity when we're stuck in that withdrawn state um and so i I think sometimes just seeking help outside yourself to say, hey, uh, have you tried this or that um, might be the catalyst to someone starting that healing process. Um, because if you physically feel better from the neck down, I think that has a spillover effect. Yeah, like, I it think really we've, does. We've talked about yes, a lot. because we've talked about how the body and the mind work together. This kind of mm -hmm. Ouroboros of the snake eating its tail. The mind affects <laughs> the body, body affects the mind. Mind yes. affects the body, body affects the mind. And so when we can figure out how to stop the body from being in pain, mm -hmm. that can help the mind stop being in pain. And yeah. if we can get the mind under control, then maybe then we can get the body to go into alignment with that and mm -hmm. how they all work together. So we've talked about things that we can control, but what about the seasons that we all have come into when things are going on that are outside of our control? You know, how do you recommend people, I guess, like you said, go back to the basics, focus on those control, but what about those more difficult seasons and stuff? And what advice do you have for people going through those? Yeah, I think life, um, life in general is about choices, right? So you can make the choice to sleep less, or you can make the choice to sleep more. You can, um, you know, and that's how we get in a pattern is because we're repetitively making that choice. Um, just a nugget in my own, this isn't anything I learned through, you know, my medical education, but, um, through my own process of learning and, uh, helping my mental health, I found a book called Loving What Is by Byron Katie. It's a phenomenal book. Um, and it walks you through the systematic, um, method of questioning. So, uh, I, I say that life is about choices and making a choice to believe a particular narrative about a situation uh, is usually our undoing, <laughs> right? So the Byron Katie, loving what is, um, she has this, this process of inquiry called the work. And so it's these four essential questions and... Um, it helps you take a situation or a, a negative belief about yourself. Like say you're going through a season of um, relational strife and you truly believe that you're a bad wife. That's the loop that's, that you're on. Um, the inquiry, the process of inquiry asks you to assess one, is that true? Is that objectively true? Is that something you can measure? Is there a good wife score sheet we can <laughs> consult? <laughs> Generally, the answer is no. no. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, and then is there a stress-free reason to sustain that belief? So do you feel a little more in control if you can just slap a I'm bad label on yourself? Is that your go-to device? Okay. Um, if that's the case, go ahead and keep believing it to keep yourself safe. But we're going to ask you to revisit that and why you do that. Um, if it... Um, is in fact productive for you to sustain that belief. Maybe it's not, you know, the I'm bad, but it's something else. Um, then it, you might just stop there in the inquiry process. If there really isn't a stress-free reason to keep looping on that idea, then you go to the next question, which is, um, who am I when I don't have this belief about myself? Hmm. Mm, I, like I love that, that one, yes. right? And then the final prompt in the work is turn it around. So what's the opposite of that belief? I'm a good wife. How do you feel when you have that belief? You know, and then you sort of explore that. So she's actually created an app called The Work that um, I want to say it's maybe $4 to download, but it walks you through just a text form fill out of what's your messed up belief <laughs> and then it takes you through and makes you journal and answer those questions. And by the end of it, you might feel a little more like, huh, 
So when your life is out of control, generally we look inward to change, you know, the situation or our belief about the situation. Um, and that can be for our benefit or for our undoing. Um, and so I really like that device um, because I think, you know, yes, you can go back to basics and you can address the physical things, but maybe as you are exercising or you're on your walk, you're just looping mentally about your scenario and your situation and how you can't ever get out of it. And that's not necessarily true mm -hmm. if we just go through those inquiry yeah. uh, questions. And I think it's important too that there's a, a people have gone through a lot of heartbreak, especially within the last year. But you know, maybe it is the loss of a loved one, or the death of a child, or the a, a substantial loss of health, or something yeah. like that. You know, loss is something that we all need to take time to grieve and yeah. process through, and to be okay with the fact that you know what, right now I'm not okay. But mm -hmm. look at these things that are going on in my life, and being okay with the fact that yes, those are sad things. Mm -hmm. So it's okay to feel sad. Yes. And it's not important for you in those moments to have a hardcore positive reason why they happened. Yeah. And yeah. you know, and don't get me wrong, I've had the blinders up mm -hmm. and I didn't reach for that app because I wasn't really ready to logically break down that emotional pain I was feeling. And that's okay, you know? Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying that every single problem and every single scenario is best addressed by this very logical, systematic mm -hmm. breakdown of, you know, your thoughts. Yeah. But if it's a chronic thing you've been looping on and you feel like you've given it enough time and it still haunts you, then turn to those things. Exactly. But for, by all means, feel the feelings, feel the feelings um, yes. and let them run their course. And I'm a journaler, so I, mm -hmm. I just write stuff out like crazy. Um, but maybe you're a talker and a verbal processor. Find that person that will listen to you. Um, maybe you're a creator. Make something. Go back to those roots. I mean, I think there are so many ways we can funnel that energy. Um, or just be sad. That's okay. You don't have to be productive, and, yeah. and that's okay. <laughs> exactly. And when you are ready to maybe do something about the grief and stuff, I think one of the best things that I've really learned is that, you know, you can believe that everything has a reason and in the moment have no idea what that reason is. Mm -hmm. But I think eventually you can get to the point where you can either discover the reason as an aha moment or you can create the reason mm -hmm. and stuff. And that, like, if you really want to believe that everything happens for a reason, which I think a lot of us do because right. it does give us that sense of, like, deeper understanding about why the world is the way the world yeah. is yeah. when we can then create the reason for us being like mm -hmm. okay like you know i had to go through x y or z because this is where i'm at now yeah. this is the reason why i'm here that can also be very very healing about kind of just that idea of changing your attitude about when you look back at these negative situations that have happened in your life which yeah. you have just done you know earlier in the podcast and you're talking about you know going through your you know your eating disorder and your health issues and and stuff now you're looking back on that with a positive lens mm -hmm. seeing that like yes because of x y and z look at where i'm at now and look at how i'm helping people mm -hmm. and i know i've been able to do that with my own life i mean this whole podcast is the reframing of i've gone through a mental health journey of my own but mm -hmm. i have to be able to take all of that knowledge <laughs> and apply it somewhere and hopefully in turn help people because yeah. For me, I think helping people is one of the greatest forms of healing and yeah. stuff is being able to say, I've been where you've been. Mm -hmm. I totally get it. We can go through this together. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's that's perfect because it's it takes you out of this victim mentality and this victim mode and puts you in a more empowered place and makes it all not for nothing, you know, yeah. and, and it, it gives purpose behind the mess. So mm -hmm. um, I... I think that's that's what it's all about. If you're going to have something bad happen, you know, use it in some way to help someone else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Jenna, this has been amazing. I can't believe that an hour has already passed. Oh my How gosh. How crazy is that? <laughs> um, I would love for you, final question, what advice do you have for people? Any any advice. We're not yeah. even going to limit it to mental health or functional medicine or anything like that. What is kind of like your soapbox advice that you really think is important for people to know about? Um, <laughs> uh, I, I just really feel like um, <sighs> it's so open-ended. I could just go so many ways with this. I, um, 
I really would encourage people to live an examined life. I think that gives so much meaning to so much of the suffering that we've gone through. Um, and to not suffer in silence and to not be, yeah, stoicism has its place. And it's, it's one thing to um, clean up some of your self-talk and not be as whiny. And it's another thing to um, really look inward and see how things are affecting you and what education or lesson can be gleaned through certain, you know, strife and difficult situations. Um, if I can just encourage people to do that more, I think we would just have such a better world if, if we just did a little self-examination sometimes. <laughs> I can completely concur with that. Oh, Absolutely. All right. Well, Jenna, <laughs> tell everybody where we can find you on social media for people who want to connect with you further. And then also I know that you have Cultivate, Cultivate Wellness for people who are listening here in Virginia who might want to also reach out with, to you for that. So kind of what are the platforms that people can find you on? Yes. Yes. So um, I'm not as active on social media as I used to be. That is uh, the directly related to my mental health. So I, I am <laughs> trying to get yes. back there. I know that I, I used to use it for good and, and I just know a lot of people use it for bad. And so I'm trying to find the balance there. Um, but if you are on Instagram and you do catch me, um, it's Dr. Jenna Montana. Uh, that's my Instagram handle. Um, and I do encourage folks, you know, if you want to know more about functional medicine, ifm.org, find a practitioner your, near you. Um, or if you just liked what you heard on this podcast, I do telemedicine. So we could work virtually. Or um, you can go to my website, cultivatewellnessva.com, um, and start the appointment process on there. Great. Thank All you right. so much. This was a blast. Thank I am you. so excited we could have this in person. Yeah. It's so different being able to like see somebody's face and kind of just like jive with them face to face than it is over the phone. So this has been yeah. an absolute pleasure. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for listening to The Drawn Podcast, empowering women battling anxiety, depression, and other mental illnesses, for I believe we've been drawn together to create a life we love. You can find more amazing content at my website, katierochetteco.com, or follow me on Instagram at The Drawn Collection.